Good evening, everyone. My name is Malcolm Hackett. As well as being a director of BRI, I also chair the board of the community company which owns and operates the five local Bendigo Bank community bank branches. And I've just come back from a conference, in fact, in Bendigo, celebrating 25 years of community banking with 750 directors from right around Australia. A fantastic event. Um, this is to celebrate the $600 million that um, community banks have pumped back into their local communities. Welcome to the uh, the fourth Bushfire Resilience Webinar of 2023, um, Grass and Bushfire Behaviour. Now, this was one of the topics suggested by BRI subscribers last year. Um, tonight, we have two presenters, Kevin Tolhurst and Justin Leonard. Um, Kevin's going to talk about weather for the upcoming summer, and that'll be immediately followed by his presentation on uh, grass and bushfire behaviour in the landscape. Uh, after a poll question, Justin will give us his insights into how a house and property is impacted by a grass fire and a bushfire. Um, then I'll have a uh, discussion um, and a question answering session with, with Kevin and Justin um, including your questions, and we'll finish at 9pm. Now, this series of presentations has been organised by Bushfire Resilience Incorporated, which is an independent, not-for-profit association focused on improving community awareness and preparedness for the threat of bushfire. These webinars have been organised on the lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people. BRI acknowledges the traditional custodians of the many lands from which you join us tonight and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this event. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connection to the lands and waters across Australia. Please note, these webinars and the presenters are providing information. It's not advice. Our intention is to provide general information about risks to property, people and animals. It's your responsibility to seek advice for your particular situation. These topics may be sensitive for some people and their suggested services are shown on the screen. Thank you to our sponsors. Benigo Bank Community Bank Branches, the CFA, the Warrandyte Riverside Market, Nillambic Shire Council, Safer Together, Rotary Diamond Creek, Rotary Eltham, and Davy Pumps. Thank you for registering your interests and for submitting your questions in advance. You'll be able to ask questions as we proceed using the Q&A function, but please keep your questions short and to the point. These webinars are being recorded and everyone who's registered will be sent the link. We're delighted um, to have Kevin Tolhurst back to join us this year. Kevin will discuss weather for this coming summer which will be immediately followed by his presentation and understanding of fire behaviour. Welcome, Kevin. Thanks, Malcolm. I'm glad to be back. I think it's interesting that um, we're dealing with grass fires tonight because often people see them as being uh, less threatening, but um, it's not really the case. They're different, but they're still. Uh, we still need to understand them. So it's interesting too to, to think that this year, this, the, the seasonal conditions that we've got basically follow uh, three years of above average rainfall. If we look across the country, we see that the vast majority of the country has had um, above average rainfall. Uh, this map from the Bureau of Meteorology showing uh, the average for the last two years. So everywhere apart from uh, the west of Western Australia, some areas along the the coast in Queensland and down in southwest Tasmania basically have had above average rainfall. However, what's interesting, if we look at the root zone moisture content, again from the Bureau of Meteorology, 
we see that uh, a lot of Eastern Australia and, and uh, Western Australia and in Southern Australia, the soils are below average moisture content already. Now, that, this is not so important in the forest areas because there's um, a certain amount of buffering goes on there. So uh, the variation is uh, not that uh, extreme, but in some of our semi-arid uh, grassland areas, it does make a, a big difference. A recent map put out by the um, AFAC, sort of in conjunction with the fire agencies across uh, Australia, show the area of Australia that's expected to be of higher fire risk this spring. Uh, and uh, the, the outlook for summer hasn't been produced yet. That's uh, to come shortly. But what we can see there is the areas that uh, are being highlighted are areas that are uh, normally uh, would have grassland, but the grassland would be relatively um, well spaced. But after wet years, there's infill in that grass area. And so fires can spread across areas that uh, would normally be difficult for a fire to spread, except under stronger wind conditions. So we see here a big chunk of Western Queensland and uh, New South Wales, the Northwest of uh, Victoria, and a big area in Southern uh, Northern Territory. Now up in the Northern part of the country, up in um, Northern Queensland, Northern Territory and West Australia, fires occur there basically every year. So they're not being shown as being exceptionally um, bad, but uh, the, the red areas are showing unusually bad areas. Along the coast down in Southern New South Wales and Victoria, these areas um, pretty limited, but uh, a lot of those areas were burnt in 2019, 2020, and the fuels there really haven't reaccumulated. So even though the, the weather conditions might be conducive to fire, it really will mainly be in more grassland or unburnt areas. So already uh, there are reports coming through of um, fire spreading in uh, southern uh, Northern Territory. So this is the Barclay region. And what you can see in this image here, if you look at the flames, is how continuous that flame front is. And that's because of the infill of grass because of the uh, recent rainfalls. And what that means is the fire will continue to burn overnight and restart the next day, spreading uh, the next day when the, the winds and the, the, the temperature increases. So that continuity of fuel um, means that the grassland areas are likely to be um, quite extensive in terms of the area burnt. So we're seeing uh, that starting already. And from last night, the Sentinel hotspots that are currently showing active fire across the country, again, we can see those areas up in uh, southern part of Northern Territory. We can see the areas in uh, inland Queensland and Western Australia. They're the areas where fires currently are burning. Uh, before we go into fire season, as well as what you'd normally expect in the dry season up in uh, the top end, uh, in the savannah woodlands up there. But you see there's a strong correlation between where the fires currently are occurring and the, um, the forecast areas of expected increased fire activity. So what this says to us, is, in a sense, is that um, it's not that we won't have fires in forested areas, but we're unlikely to have extensive uh, fires in that forested area until uh, the drought conditions uh, develop. And that's not a certainty at this stage, but we are looking towards, particularly in Eastern Australia with the El Nino um, kicking in, we're likely to see uh, lower rainfall. And so it's the, the beginning of a drying out period. So in the next two or three years, that if that uh, drying pattern continues, then we might see some significant fires in forested areas. But for this year, it will largely be in the um, semi-arid sort of grassland areas, which uh, could burn very large areas of the country, millions of hectares, but largely in uh, low population density areas and areas where there's fewer uh, assets in terms of houses and infrastructure. But keep your eyes open for how the season then develops beyond this summer. So I hope that provides some explanation as to what the seasonal conditions might be. It's um, I've heard some expressions saying this is going to be the worst ever fire season. Um, there may be some very large areas burnt of grassland. The similar sort of thing happened in 1974, where about 200 million hectares got burnt after a, a wet period. But um, the 
that's a natural part of the, the cycling, if you like. So it's something to be aware of, but not necessarily to be um, considered to be disastrous at this point, but be aware of grassland areas because grasses dry out quite quickly um, as soon as the rain stops. Okay, so I'll move on now to my main uh, point for this evening, which is really trying to understand grassland fire behavior uh, because grassland fire behavior is quite important. And just in terms of terms, technically uh, bushfire refers to all types of vegetation fire, whether it be in forest, woodlands, heathlands or grasslands. But often you hear agencies and people refer to bushfires and grass fires. Uh, bushfires uh, are meant to be, is meant to be a generic term. So we can talk about bushfires, but bush, bushfires might be grass fires, they might be forest fires, they might be shrub fires, uh, they might be heath fires. But uh, just be aware of the terminology and try and use it accurately if you can. Bushfires are meant to be a generic term. What's important is that grass fires can be lethal. We have a record of fatalities of people being killed in grass fires. So they shouldn't be considered to be some uh, lesser quantity in a sense. And, and Justin will help drive you through some of the, um, the hazards associated with grass fires in his talk. Grass fires can destroy homes and other assets. So they really need to be taken seriously. So what I want to discuss is what's special about grass fires. So if we look at the fuels in grasslands in the same way that we uh, assess any other fuel uh, in the landscape, they basically are made up of surface and near surface fuels. So surface fuels being the, the, the dead horizontal, horizontally spread component and near surface being the, the, the more vertical um, elevated fuel above the, the ground, but connected to the ground. And that's all described in detail in the overall fuel hazard guide um, that uh, Francis Hines and others uh, produced in 2010. And hopefully you've come across that before. So near surface fuels have a strong vertical orientation. And as we uh, go through a discussion about uh, the grassland fire behavior, that vertical orientation should seem uh, increasingly important to you. And that vertical orientation exposes the fuel to the, the wind, the sun, um, and therefore uh, the, the rate at which the fuel heats and dries is uh, quite rapid because of that um, well-aired exposed orientation. But in a fire situation, it is also um, a structure that allows for rapid heat transfer when it's burning. So it's not about having more oxygen, it's really about the, the structure for um, heat transfer. And about 80% of the heat that comes from a fire is coming from convective heat or the hot gases. And because that can move through the fuel more freely when it's vertical, then the um, rate of heat transfer is greater. And so the rate of combustion and the rate of spread is greater. So looking at a, an image here of uh, grassland, we can see that the uh, the the grass, dry grass here is, has a vertical structure. It's burning quite well. Flames are unlikely to, to be any more than eight metres. And often it's only more like two to four metres high in, in grassland, just because the quantity of fuel is not that great, but its arrangement is ideal for fire spread. Uh, this is another image of um, what you might call a grassland. In fact, this is canola stubble. And what you might notice here is the black smoke because of the high oil content of the material. So the chemical composition um, is of some importance as well as the dryness of the fuel. But here we've got higher flames and, and uh, more intense fire behavior just because of the chemical composition of the, uh, the fuel that's burning, even though it's a grassland. So crops can be considered grassland as well. If we understand a little more about grasses, grasses can be either annual or perennial. Annual grasses dry off each year after setting seed. And as they dry off, we describe their degree of dryness according to the curing percentage. And curing is just a measure of the percentage dead grass out of the, the total amount of grass present. So if you like the proportion of dead to live. 
So the live grass is uh, taking up moisture through the root system from the soil. So the live grass has tends to, because it's still alive, is uh, has higher moisture content than the dead grass is likely to have because it's still a functioning um, organism and uh, will be determined by its growth state. So whether it's um, vigorously growing or in a senescent sort of stage. Dead grass, on the other hand, basically varies according to uh, the weather conditions. So recent rain, the, the air temperature, the relative humidity, the wind and the solar radiation. So it can change very rapidly. And because it's vertically oriented and it's very fine in its structure, that rate of um, drying is incredibly rapid. In forest fuels, it might take a couple of hours to uh, readjust. In grass fuels, the, the moisture is taken up from the, the change in air temperature and relative humidity um, in basically in seconds. So annual grasses have this uh, lo annual cycle of um, growth and, and dying off. Perennial grasses, on the other hand, live for many years. And so there are always some green parts, but there are also the dead parts from previous year's growth. So generally that perennial grasses are deep rooted, so they get access to more moisture than the annual grasses will. Um, and some of them even have a special uh, growth uh, metabolic pathway, a C4 pathway, which means that they can basically photosynthesize under really dry conditions. So kangaroo grass and phalaris uh, a couple of grasses that basically have this ability to grow even when conditions are dry. So generally, there's a greater biomass in this perennial grass because it accumulates over time. So it, it is important to distinguish between perennial grasses and uh, annual grasses when you're looking at the, the, the grasses as a fuel to, and understand those cyclic processes that are going on. So here's a couple of photos of grassland on the left. Uh, you see basically, a, well, it's a roadside, uh, pure grass, but there's always a few trees around often. Uh, and those trees and the shrubs can actually affect the, the wind speed, but also provide embers for spotting. So grasslands are rarely just continuous grass. They're often uh, mixed with uh, some other vegetation, but we can see here an extensive area of grass. On the right, the bottom right there is... Um, also a grassland, but with trees. Now, why I'm calling it a grassland is because the predominant fuel underneath the, across the ground is grass, but the trees are affecting the wind and the sun and the exposure to the, so the, the drying process. So the trees have an influence, but they're not contributing a lot to the fuel on that site. So there's a distinction here to be made between what you would call a, a forest or a woodland and what you would call a, 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 a grassland with trees, if you like. So um, hopefully I can explain that a little better to you. So here's an image, uh, an aerial image of a, an area in Victoria that you, you may or may not <laughs> relate to. This is a Yan Yan Reservoir. So here we've got a clear area of forest. It'll have forest fields. Down here, uh, we've got an area that's largely grassland but the, some of the grassland is um, got uh, borders of trees or, or shrubs along fence lines. Uh, over here, we've got uh, an area that's uh, grassland, but I would say that it's um, what we're looking at here is because of the um, trees, the fuel is predominantly grass, but the trees will be slowing the wind down and therefore reducing the rate at which fire will spread through there, but also um, reducing the rate at which those grasses will dry. So a little bit like the photograph I showed you in the previous slide. Compared with this little patch of um, treed area here, which is dense enough that the, the main fuels underneath it will be forest fuels. So just because you have trees present doesn't necessarily mean that you have um, a, a, a forest um, uh, well, a grassland or a forest, it depends on what the dominant uh, fuel is underneath the, along the ground, whether you call it a grassland or a forest. So the things that are important to you, are basically uh, how the trees might affect the wind reduction. So slow the wind down. And, uh, but the trees will also potentially provide uh, a source of spotting material. So embers 
that can uh, go ahead and that can dramatically increase the rate at which fires spread across the landscape and whether or not fire breaks are, are, are effective. So the presence of trees are important, even though you still may have predominantly grassland areas. Something else that's worth considering is this idea of uh, thatch. So in this image on the right that I've got here, um, we've what we're looking at here is a um, an area of uh, a layer of dead grass underneath the live grass, and this layer of dead grass uh, basically provides continuity of fuel along the ground. But because it's dead, it's likely to be uh, more available for fuel. So sometimes you can find fires burning in grassland that looks as though it's totally green, but when you dig down underneath it, you find that there's this layer of uh, dead material underneath, which is called thatch. So it's hidden out of sight. It's from previous year's growth and it forms this continuous layer. So it means the fire can continue to burn overnight and it can spread basically in all directions, depending on the um, continuity of the fuel. So <clears throat> don't be um, like tricked by thinking because it's green on top that it won't burn. So the thatch significantly increases the amount of heat that's generated by the fire, even though it might be a slower smouldering type fire, because it has a horizontal continuity, horizontal orientation rather than the vertical orientation. So um, it's this burning overnight and continue to smoulder that creates a, a problem with thatch. And thatch tends to develop in areas that haven't been burnt or grazed. So uh, that would be the case in a lot of properties, for example, where uh, the grass might be just uh, slashed. So you get this continuous layer. That's why burning an area uh, has an advantage over um, just uh, slashing it. Right, so just moving on to um, grass, a bit more about grassland behaviour, where grasses tend to be more open and exposed to the wind, and the wind drives the flames and heat forward, increasing the rate of spread. So that openness to the wind means that the wind has a greater influence. The fuels, the grass fuels tend to be uh, more vertically orientated. So again, that's great for exposure to the wind and the sun, which means more rapid drying. But it also means from the fire point of view, better heat transfer, uh, the heat that's generated from the flaming part of the fuel uh, is effective in preheating the, the fire ahead of it. In grassland fuels, generally speaking, we're talking about fuels that are less than about two millimetres thick, whereas in forest fuels, we're talking about uh, fuels up to six millimetres. But that fineness of the fuels means that the, the grass fuels respond to changes in uh, temperature and relative humidity, and therefore the, the dryness of that fuel much quicker than uh, forest fuels will. The, the fineness of the fuel also means that the burnout time of that fuel is much quicker. So within about five to 10 seconds compared with forest fuels, which are normally about 40 to 120 seconds. So about eight times longer in forest. And that affects the, the depth of the flaming front. So the um, that persistence of flaming affects the total amount of heat that's being given out at any particular time. So I've said here the maximum flame height is likely to be uh, less than eight metres. Five to eight metres is a pretty high flame for grassland. Often it's more like two to four metres high. But because the fuels are finer and likely to be drier, they're easier to ignite and therefore they're more likely to be prone to spot fire development, uh, especially if you have trees or shrubs around that are likely to provide embers and, and burning material to start these spot fires. However, because of the fineness of the fuel, they're unlikely to form plume or convection-driven um, processes unless they're associated with significant areas of forest. So why is that important? In 2019-2020 fires, we saw a lot of uh, plume-driven, convection-driven fires. And that is a scale above what we would uh, see in grasslands alone. And so you've got to be careful to uh, understand that there's a, a difference between grass fires and, and forest fires in this respect of how much they can scale up and interact with the uh, atmosphere. So to try and help get a picture of what's uh, how fires propagate and why the vertical structure is so important, I've got a little video here. And what I want you to watch 
is how the heat is not just all going up. Some of it is actually being drawn back into the fuel bed. And because it's a deep fuel bed and an open fuel bed, the heat can go down and preheat the fuel and basically ignite the fuel from the bottom. It's not just burning across the top of the fuel here. It actually burns down into it because of these uh, hot gas vortices that are driving the fuel down. So as this video starts, uh, this is the, the starting image. You'll see the hottest part of the fire here is in the center of the image. But as it progresses, you'll see that the hottest part keeps oscillating from left to right, left to right. So the heat, the flames are not just going up. You'll see some of them are actually being curled back into the fuel bed. So the flame gives you a bit of a tracer of what's happening here. But there's hot gases going down that you can't see as well into the, the fuel bed that's preheating the fuel. And it's one of the reasons why slashing the fuel and getting it flat on the ground, for example, reduces the rate of spread of the fire, even though the total amount of heat output is still the same. It slows it down considerably because the heat transfer process is nowhere near as efficient. So this is a, a, a been done in a, a wind tunnel in, in Missoula in, in a lab in um, the US uh, using an artificial fuel bed here, which is actually cardboard rather than grass, but uh, it, it simulates grass or stubble crops in itself. So we need to get our understanding that fires are being driven by convective heat and that heat is not just all going up. A lot of that heat is getting recirculated back into the, the, the um, down to ground level. And that's really important. Um, so 80% of the heat that's being generated comes from this convective heat. And whilst we the majority of it goes up into the atmosphere, some of it does come back to the ground. And a small proportion of 80% is still a lot of heat compared with the radiative heat. We focus too much on the radiation because our eyes are attracted to that and we don't see the hot air as easily. We might see it if there's smoke in it or in this case, uh, uh, radiating um, particles that, uh, that we see as flames. So here's an image of uh, a grass fire in Western Victoria. What we can see here is the flame depth is, is very narrow. So, it's only about 30 centimetres deep. The flame height is about maybe a metre high, uh, and that's largely to do with the, the height of the grass. But the, the depth of the flame uh, is quite narrow, and because the burnout time, the residence time of the fuel is very short. Here's a, an image from uh, a CSIRO experiment from uh, quite a while ago, back in the um, early 1990s, late 1880s. 1880s, uh, where this is fairly pure grasslands, few trees scattered in here. But uh, there are a number of things that I want you to see here. One is that all these three fires were lit at the same time. This was from a point ignition. That was a 50 metre line. This was a 100 metre line. And what you can see here is the, 100 metre, the line uh, fire that started with 100 metres has burnt much quicker than the one from 50 metres or a point ignition. So the scale of the fire is important to um, how well it engages with the weather and is driven by the fire. But what I want you also to see is that even though these fires were lit from a straight line, they've ended up with a, uh, a parabolic sort of head to them in, in the same way that the point ignition has. And that's partly because the heat that's rising off the burnt ground as well as the flaming front here is basically being drawn into the, the, the center here and that heat uh, draw-in is basically uh, controlling the flames, pulling the flames in. So as this, the smoke or the heat from this fire is being uh, directed by the wind, the, the fire direction also changes. So in this case here, there's a little bit of a shift of the wind to the left. And so this flank of the fire is quite active, whereas the, the right-hand flank here is um, uh, quiet because the, the wind is just fluctuating in its direction a little bit, uh, and that will change from time to time. But what we see again is the pretty shallow uh, flame width, so uh, because of the, the rapid burnout time. But the two heat sources, there's a, the, the, well, the wind that's being driven horizontally across the ground, and then the heat 
uh, driving air upwards. And the, uh, the resultant of those two interactions is uh, what we see in the fire. So grass fires spread uh, can spread quite fast, 20 kilometres an hour on, uh, on it for an average um, rate of spread is quite fast compared with a forest where the maximum might be around 12 kilometres an hour. However, it's important to say, and you'll hear lots of people make reports, but the fire can spread quicker than that for up to 200 to 400 metres uh, in about 10 or 20 seconds. So basically what's happening there is you have these pyrolyzed flammable gases being blown ahead of the fire, setting fire to the grass in front of it, but it can't sustain for very long because it's just been a buildup of these gases, it's been blown forward. But two to 400 metres is a long, quite a distance um, to suddenly think you're uh, a long way from the fire, to suddenly have the fire at your at your, uh, at your feet because the uh, the gases have been blown across the, the fuel and suddenly set fire to it. So there can be instances where the fire spreads as fast as the wind, but it can't be sustained. It's only for a matter of seconds. When we're talking about how far a fire can spread in an hour, 20 kilometres is uh, getting up there. Uh, there are reports of up to about 30 kilometres in 40 minutes. 30 kilometer uh, an hour for 40 minutes, but uh, not sustained for the full hour. Grass fire spread is strongly driven by wind. So the rate of spread of grass is approximately equal to 20% or a fifth of the average wind speed. So there's a, a little rule of thumb you can use. Miguel Cruz came up with that one. Um, and if you double the wind speed, you basically double the rate at which the fire goes. So there's a direct relationship, a proportional relationship so if the wind speed goes from um, 20 kilometres an hour to 40 kilometres an hour, the, the rate of spread would go from four kilometres an hour to, um, to, to eight kilometres an hour. So if you're doubling the wind speed, you're doubling the rate of spread of the fire. So wind is really important in driving it once it's cured. Under extreme conditions, the grass fuel... Um, be very dry and, and uh, strongly wind driven in forest fuels, very similar. So it'll be driven by the wind, but also uh, uh, terrain. In catastrophic conditions, we're basically looking at um, same for grass, but forest fires can go that one step further and be basically convection driven or plume driven because of the interaction with the upper atmosphere. There's just not enough heat uh, being able to generate at one time to, to have that same interaction. But as the winds get stronger, the, far, the fires will go faster. So where grassland and forest mix, the fire behaviour of forests is likely to be dominated by the um, forest fuels just because of the amount of fuel that's there. So it's often about 10 times as much fuel in a forest as there is in grassland. Grass condition is considered to be more relevant to uh, fire behaviour than the quantity. So natural... Um, on the top left-hand corner, so uh, all the seed heads are still basically intact, um, grazed on the, the top right where um, there's been some disruption to it, such as uh, slashing it or grazing it. Uh, and the rate of spread here would only be 80% of what it would be in the natural. And then there's eaten out, where the rate of spread would only be about half of that in the natural because the fuels are so discontinuous. Compared with um, a Bushfire, where we can see uh, here, because of the convection being driven, all these spot fires are being drawn into the, um, the main plume. So this is what, when people talk about the fire creating their own weather, that's less likely to occur in grass fire because there's not as much heat being generated. Uh, a simulation from 2009 on Pine Ridge Road, we can sort of see the fire is largely being driven by the prevailing winds. So that's the direction the fire's going. But when you look closely at what's happening with fires, they're coming from all directions. So people in Pine Ridge Road would have experienced fires coming at them from all directions because of the ter wind terrain interaction. And that wind terrain interaction is very complex. This is a, a like a weather simulation of, of wind across landscape. What we're seeing here, the different colours are showing different wind strengths. But um, we've got the prevailing wind coming from the west, but here's some wind channeling showing the wind going from the, the south. Um, at the ridge top, it's going faster because of the uh, acceleration over the top. 
The, on the lee side of the hill, there's uh, eddy formation. The wind's coming in the opposite direction. So it's much more complex than you uh, might imagine. And so where you live in the landscape and the direction the wind is coming from may affect the, the winds and the direction the fire might travel to. And just because you're on a sheltered slope or a, an easterly slope or a southerly slope doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be less exposed to fire. In fact, you could be uh, even more severely impacted by fire because the, the, the winds are being affected by the topography. So you can get a lot more information from, this is a fantastic book that um, Phil Training and Andrew Sullivan put together about grass fires. And if you go searching on the internet, you'll find a number of pyro pages that uh, CSIRO have published uh, that in, uh, talk about lots of things, including uh, grass fires. So in summary, grass fires can be lethal. So let's uh, have that up front. Grass fires can travel rapidly across the landscape, faster than forest fires. Grass fire spread at rates uh, very dependent on the fuel dryness and the wind speed and direction, but winds can be very variable uh, depending on the topography. Grass fuel structure rather than fuel load is the biggest has the biggest impact on fire behaviour. So even slashing fuel, a slashing grass will reduce the rate of spread of the fire, even though this, all the fuel is still there. If you remove the fuel as, as well, that's even better. Grass fires alone cannot become pyroconvective like forest fires. So there's a limit to how much they can scale up in comparison. But where they are mixed with forest, they can be very dangerous because you're getting almost the worst of both worlds. Very fast moving fires, but also the spotting process and the ability to have very large uh, fires. And then you can have uh, interactions with plumes. So thank you for listening to that. That was um, quite a quick run through but hopefully you get a, a bit of a feeling for um, what grass fires can do. So thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Now, we'd like everyone who's watching to make a choice on the poll question that's going to come up on your screen. Um, since we began in, in 2020, um, BRI webinars have focused on awareness and the preparation of people, properties, and houses. And what we want to know is how robust will your preparation be for the summer of 2023 24? And you've got a single choice. So we're asking you, you've, you've got a lot of knowledge over the last couple of years. You, you see a, a particularly dry, possibly very dangerous summer emerging. How good do you think your preparations are? We'll have a look at those um, results later. Justin Leonard is, is uh, one of our regular presenters and um, he's provided really helpful information um, uh, based on his 20 years of research with the CSIRA. We, we really appreciate um, Justin presenting again. Um, over to you, Justin. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Malcolm just uh, share my screen. So um, after that fantastic um, exploration of the unique aspects of grass fires and how they compare to bushfires, I want to delve into that similar topic and perspective, but really looking out from the house's perspective um, to understand what it really means to experience um, the impact or onset of um, those grass and forest fires and how they fundamentally differ. And I guess unpacking it from that um, house perspective or experiential perspective, I guess, helps us also then to um, unpack what it might um, be in terms of solutions and approaches to, to manage those interactions that can be the most problematic um, in potentially igniting our homes and, and threatening our own life safety. Um, so at the highest level, I guess, um, what's really important to note is that the things that are drying out the landscape and priming the vegetation, such as the grasslands, to allow it to become a continuous and formidable fire source are exactly the same weather conditions that are drying out and priming our homes and the elements around our homes 
um, to make them um, at their most flammable. Um, unfortunately, that coincides with the um, with with the flammable landscape. Um, our houses and the combustible aspects of our houses and the things around it are at their driest and most combustible at exactly the same time um, for the same reasons the the weather drivers and contexts um, prime them up at exactly the same time. So rather than sort of thinking about, um, you know, how combustible a deck or a fence or um, a garden bed is currently, um, we really have to take our minds to that dry soil, dry lofted um, mulch and the constructed timber elements that are that are ever present around our our houses and are part of our houses um, uh, being really well primed for for impact from um, the various things that that we've worked through in in previous sessions that um, span things like ember attack, radiant heat, um, flames from a an approaching fire front, surface fire, um, which is sort of the more more blind low level um, uh, burning surfaces and that continuity that Kevin um, highlighted so eloquently. Um, the consequential fires, which are all those other elements around our houses, like retaining walls and vehicles and fences, um, the ever-present issue of tree and branch strike, um, uh, which is largely exacerbated by the wind and the fact that the fires are getting up into the trees and exploiting defects in those trees and knots and whatnot, where they can drop branches or even fall over completely. That, that can even be a reality in a sparsely treed grassland as well. Don't forget the grass um, fires can burn through and past those trees. It can wick up the certain trees according to their bark type and involve and, and get into knots and defects in those trees and cause either tree fall or branch fall. Um, we can't rule those out even in a in a grassland context. Um, and the debris accumulation which can happen during those events um, and obviously um, in the, the many months and years that lead up to these events can be very effective debris contributors. If we sort of just channel out the 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 grassy um, attack mechanism um, in itself, um, ember attack still there. Now, Kevin would have um, highlighted that that embers are definitely not as virulent and aggressive um, from a grassy source. Um, the bark on trees are far more effective at creating persistent and resilient bark. Um, many of the photos that Kevin showed really didn't show a very strong amber plume or cloud above those um, those grassy fuels um, at all. And that's because they're not particularly good at causing ember attack, although they do cause some. And that the, the few grassy based embers that are created certainly burn out quicker as they're traveling through the air. So they only really have um, a reach or effect at a much shorter distance. So well less than a hundred meters, more like sort of up to 50 metres, if you like. Um, but that's not to discount that there's many other sources of ambers in the landscape. So the bark on the few trees that are around, and certainly as we approach an urban interface, um, things like mulch beds or tan bark on the ground um, and other sources become the dominant ember attack sources that can persist. And obviously, because there's less trees associated with a grassland, you can think of wind and the wind actions as being far more prevalent. Um, so it will drive the, those fewer embers further and also be a direct attack me mechanism on these structures themselves. Now, um, if you look carefully at this diagram, it's kind of showing a fire and a predominant wind direction from the left to the right. And what's worth highlighting is that the debris 
and the way um, things are ignited tend to build up. Um, they, you know, obviously they can attack the windward side of the structure. So, so where the wind's blowing against the structure and air pressure blows things up against the structures. But it might be surprising that it's actually not those windward attack sides of the structures that are the first to necessarily ignite and start to burn from this sort of ember attack, um, debris attack, surface fire attack approach. It's actually the leeward sides and the hidden cavities and little obscure nooks and crannies around the house where the wind speeds are much lower that allow the ignitions of debris to actually build up and take hold into a flaming fire. It's almost like the the windward side or the windy side of the structures are too windy for them to hold um, take hold as easily. So um, certainly think about um, every aspect of your house and all the nooks and crannies um, in terms of their combustibility um, and where you might get water to, for example, um, are all really key things to consider. Um, and I guess as we move to sort of considering the effects of a grassy fire, we're thinking less about the sheer intensity of the flame front that arrives, the sheer radiant heat that might be generated, therefore thinking far less about sort of a dominant attack direction type thinking of a fire to a more insidious or ubiquitous type of attack that could um, see little fires spring up in unusual spots, um, not in that dominant attack direction. Um, and in terms of um, how we then extend that to our thinking about um, siting and how our house siting actually plays out, um, the the obvious issue around um, vegetation separation from the housing footprint is a is a common one that we all talk about. Um, considering the wind directions um, that that are common in a fire, so. You know, down here we think about sort of a north nor'easter sort of swinging around to a south southwester, um, and that escalation of fire in the landscape as you swing from a sort of a a narrow expanding conical fire to a to that whole cone turning into a massive flank fire. Um, but as Kevin um, pointed out, um, in terms of wind, there's so many complex little terrain factors and even the vegetation and the roughness of that vegetation causes um, winds to swirl and locally and there's many accounts of how fires can come from um, unusual directions but also multiple directions so think about the potential of fire fronts coming um, at you from many or all possible directions and to think carefully about what that means to you, how you choose to, um, to to manage your own life safety and how you prepare your house. So um, in terms of uh, the, uh, the other main factors too, uh, uh, I guess a house isn't necessarily threatened by smoke itself, but smoke is a major factor if we're thinking about our own behaviour and exposure. And um, I really like that um, key observation from Kevin around how those oil, more oily um, canola cropping fuel, um, grassy fuels were far more acrid um, because there was significantly more oil in those types of grasses than other types. Um, that can translate very quickly to um, how incapacitating that smoke is and when you think about those open grassier environments the winds blowing those um, more aggressively and pushing that smoke um, along the ground reaching more places than necessarily seeing the smoke kind of go up in a plume and, and away from from um, being a, a more direct exposure risk to individuals. Um, as we get into those urban environments, of course, there's lots of urban fuels that become um, sources of smoke as well. And 
they're significantly more toxic again. So having a good hard think about um, the sources of toxic smoke and fumes that belong to the assets around you, could be a car or a fiberglass boat or the contents of your shed or um, even a, a painted or stained fence or trellis. Um, they're all really key things. And of course, when a house starts to burn itself, well, it really takes that smoke and toxicity to the next level. In terms of um, then how we really think about um, the building itself and its adequacy for um, standing up, even if we're thinking about a, a grass fire attack, the surface fires that come in, that, that continuity of, of surface fire, even if it's a mown dry grass, um, we've, we've obviously significantly reduced the intensity of the grass fire itself, but we have not um, eliminated the continuity of fuel on the ground. So we'll see a much more benign fire spread, but the fire will still arrive and it will still, and therefore it can still find all of those near ground elements that are at risk. So it might find a wheelie bin and burn it, it might find and burn in under a deck. Um, all of those near ground combustible elements are particularly relevant and because they're com th those elements that we're trying to seek out and understand are combustible themselves, you don't need much of a, f of a fire um, to actually get the thing to burn, particularly if debris build up on it or against it. So um, re reducing and, and, and lowering that arrival intensity is important, but um, it's really important to recognise and understand that under these really dry conditions, um, unless you've got a really good water supply to keep your, your, your lawn nice and green right through these epically dry summers, um, you're going to have a, a, a fuel continuity problem, even if it's very short grass. And therefore, that attention to all of those consequential um, fire sources um, uh, and weaknesses near the ground of your house itself is absolutely critical to um, to address. In terms of sort of moving to um, the actual physical house design itself, well, um, it, all houses certainly aren't created equal. And if we're talking about houses that have raised subfloors or even open um, subfloor spaces, very important to pay attention to um, the degree to which they're clean. Um, ideally, if they're sealed off um, from amber and surface fire attack, that's the ultimate um, scenario. Um, but things like stored material and attention to detail around that base of the house is key as well as what we've decided to immediately build off the side of our houses. It might be, you know, living areas and, and patios or driveways and carports. Um, um, all of that near ground level attack is absolutely critical. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, less so the elevated areas because the amber attacks are less important. Um, um, higher up because you get less virulent embers unless the particular trees and iconic trees that you might have around your property have a high bark hazard which means they might be um, burning over those barky surfaces which is a process known as candling where the the bark itself burns in isolation. It's not really part of a formal fire front. It's just burning over the surface of the bark and with the wind conditions that will be spraying embers all over the place. So that brings back that ember element. Um, and I guess it's important really to think about embers more of uh, a process of eliminating ember vulnerability of your structure of your house and its surrounding elements is really the, the way you have to think about embers and less so about whether you've got a landscape that's particularly low or 
high um, capacity to actually generate the embers. There's still always going to be a lot of embers kicking around. And, and it's very important to note that those embers, while they can certainly arrive before the fire front, which is, which is really, um, really challenging because it can actually ignite houses prior to the main peak of their arrival, which has obvious life safety issues. It'll really crescendo around that main part of the fire arrival process. Um, but then once that fire front sort of um, uh, passes and and moves through, the the winds are uh, can be particularly strong and persist. And if those winds persist um, in the many hours after the fire front, so will the embers. Um, and in fact, because the burnout of of various aspects of the landscape can last for hours, if not many days, so will the embers. Um, so if winds can persist well beyond these um, initial um, fire impacts, you will get embers that could persist. And unfortunately, we've seen um, houses ignite and burn down in many days after the fire events because of that persistent ember attack. Um, which makes it even more appropriate and relevant to really focus um, your attention on on embers and and their role in in burning houses down. Um, and I guess in wrap up, um, what I really want to emphasise is really living with this implication of bushfire risk is um, you know regulation can take us so far, but in terms of um, that there's no really um, effective overall regulation that can just um, specify and require um, ultimate um, effectiveness of, of a house surviving. So really it comes down to um, uh, we're all in this together in terms of accepting what regulation can do for us and how far it can get. And then it's over to us to really have a a good hard think about what an integrated approach that involves a shared responsibility between the homeowner as a main as a a modifier and maintainer of our structures um, to to work with either our legacy houses that were, were built before regulation or the ones that were built with regulation and that unpacking this whole process and enabling community to understand what fires can and can't do and how these elements do and don't respond are really the, the core of, of, of working out how to effectively manage it and maintain our houses in an effective way. And really embracing this idea that, that these fires play and shape an important, or play a, re, a really important role in shaping a unique landscape and making it healthy and, and virulent um, uh, and, and and defining it as a as a as a landscape and i'll leave it there thank you we're going to do a little bit of a promotion here um can i um ask anyone who's watching please encourage your friends and your your community groups who live in these uh, same areas that we do where they're living with bushfire risk become a um, subscriber um to these webinars um, register with us and then uh, you'll, they'll be informed when uh, recordings are available. And uh, please follow our Facebook page, share our posts. And uh, on that note, thank you to the numerous uh, groups and individuals around Australia who've, who've shared the post before this, um, uh, this webinar. Um, they really do help to get the, uh, the, the message out and um, uh, to prepare other people for, for um, the coming summer. Um, if you haven't already been there, explore our website. There's some fantastic resources there. You'll find bite-sized segments of each of the previous 17 webinars. There's interviews with people who've been through bushfires. There's transcripts, so you can read um, the, the, uh, uh, the information people have provided. And there's a fantastic search engine so you can find topics and, uh, using keywords. So it's it's um, it's really useful. Can I ask you, please support our fundraising raffle because that's um, going to enable us to continue 
There's two grand prizes, each comprising a Davy Firefighter single impeller pump and a Bunnings gift voucher. And you'll find the details on the website. Um, and uh, a plug for Davy for um, um, for uh, sponsoring us again um, this year and helping us raise funds. Um, so, yeah, feedback survey, which you will receive, can we ask that you please um, complete it? Um, it uh, has provided us with really helpful uh, information about how to structure our webinars. And I'm pleased to say that a huge percentage of viewers uh, do complete that survey, but um, that would be great if you could do that. Let's go and have a look at these um, poll results. It's fantastic to see people have obviously been thinking about their preparations and, and getting ready. And I guess what is important, I think, is to appreciate that you can't do this all in the, the week before a bad uh, um, fire day. It, it takes a lot of time to prepare. And so um, it's fantastic to see there are so many uh, good, very good and excellent uh, preparations in place. And I guess the question is, uh, how well have they been tested and practised, in a sense, to make sure that they actually work? So this self-assessment uh, needs to be uh, tested to make sure it's robust. I think I think it's um, it's a good sign that it appears we're preaching to the converted. <laughs> um, I, I'd note that I think I, my preparations are pretty good this year. I I reckon I was pretty poor last year, and that was partly because of the uh, the wet weather we'd had. And I suspect that a lot of my friends um, certainly talk in the same way that we, we've been, if, if not lulled into a, a false security, certainly there's that sense of better get organised. Um, let's tease out some of the uh, the topics tonight. Um, and uh, then uh, and Kevin and uh, Justin will answer some of your questions as well. But to start the session off, I'm going to ask... Um, uh, you, Justin, about some some commonly held beliefs concerning fire behaviour um, that I guess some of us might think think of them as fire myths. And you've already, I reckon, answered my first one, but I'm going to pose it, and you can give a a, a quick uh, answer again. And that's that the facade of a house, a nearby vegetation facing the wind, is the only location affected by a bushfire. Yeah. So I, so I guess I covered that to some extent. And I guess what we're finding is houses actually uh, are more, more, more preeminently ignite and burn from the, the downwind side back towards the wind. So it actually tends to be more dominant in entering the, um, the back of the house and burning back through. And I guess that seems a little bit counterintuitive when you think about fire fronts sort of raging towards a house. But in fact, it's um, more common for houses to ignite and burn without actually having to face that really severe fire front attack. That's actually more more of a, a, a minor or, or most houses don't actually experience that brute force frontal assault of a fire, they're, they're burning from the more insidious ways, which is why it seems to be far more um, common where house ignitions are observed and uh, their progressions observed that it's actually happening from the downward side back. I guess this, this question's related and, and that's, is it true that if your property's on the down slope of a hill that you're going to be safer in a bushfire? Um, meaning, I guess, that the fuels are above you rather than below you, um, mm. I guess, is the, is the assumption there. Being on a slope simply means you're, you're, um, you've got potentially elevated fire behaviour and particularly, f uh, and specifically from the, the fuels that are below you. So a grassland fuel on a slope can be more serious. Um, uh, fires can burn across um, slopes and I guess the fact that you're on a slope means that the broader terrain around you has complexity to it and like mm -hmm. Kevin articulated there's quite a lot of dynamics 
um, wind dynamics and um, unknowns that are entered simply by the fact that you're in that terrain. And therefore, I think you have to sort of broaden your thinking around um, about all the other aspects of um, of what that broader terrain context is going to bring. Malcolm, if I could just add to that, in yeah. the 2009 fires, the most intense areas of fire were actually on the eastern slopes, which you would was the opposite direction to what the wind was coming. And a couple of reasons for that. Because they're sheltered slope, they tend to have more vegetation and fuel because of the uh, better growth conditions. But also uh, that's where a lot of the embers were falling and then being drawn back up into the main fire event. So um, it was really surprising to see that the most intense areas weren't on the, the windward side, but on the leeward side because of this uh, uh, inner drought conditions where those fuels suddenly become available and, and get drawn back into the, the main fire event. And there's no no way of cooling then. <laughs> You're, all your air being drawn in is hot air. So it can be quite counterintuitive. Uh, what might be look good on a mild conditions doesn't necessarily apply under really severe drought conditions. Mm -hmm. that, those um, wind directions you showed on Pine Ridge Road certainly um, bears out what lots of people talked about in Strathewan about the fire coming from every direction possible on on, on numerous occasions, so uh, um, working its way around depending on what the the, the wind was and the, where they were located. Um, and and the, the, I guess the last one to you, um, Justin, is it, is it? Lots of people say, oh well, if you, if you're more than hundred meters from the um, from the bushland, um, then you won't have to worry about amber attack. So I guess um, lost lost statistics when you look across the sort of broad set of how and where houses are burnt down. There's really losses out to six seven hundred meters from what you'd call conventional forest fuels and and other conventional fuel sources so i think that more or less defines the the sort of maximum ember reach um kind of distances you need to think of before you're you know more or less immune from potential ember or ember attacks that are of the intensity enough to ignite your house and immediate surroundings um there would be exceptions to that under really extreme weather conditions, but that's sort of just looking across the broader context. What's what's achieved is approximately eighty percent of all the house loss um, is uh, falls within that first hundred meters, um, and then it's a very long taper of of loss, ember related impact loss, way out to. To that six and seven hundred meter range, so you really have to think about it over those distances, and not, I guess, to um, become overconfident by the fact that, for instance, regulation um, notionally stops at hundred meters in terms of requiring house construction. It's actually just saying, well, eighty percent survival rates um, acceptable in terms of setting up minimum regulation, um, and uh, and losses beyond that are, are common and and are of, often observed. Um, Kevin, here's a question for you. You mentioned um, trees slow can slow the grass fire. This person wants to know where they can find information on designing and growing a fire break of trees to slow grass fire. Yeah, well, I guess there's a couple of aspects to that. Um, the, the CSRO fire. Uh, behaviour model for grassland for northern Australia, it takes into account the effect of trees and slowing the, the wind. So a woodland environment where you've got about 30% tree uh, cover um, will slow the wind by about a factor of two. And uh, when you're more closer to forest, so more than 30%. Uh, so instead of going from the 10 to 30%, you're going 30% to uh, more. Um, then the wind reduction factor would be about three. Now, the, the second part of that story is you, you probably need to be then choosing species that uh, aren't going to cont contribute to your ember load or when they uh, do burn or the um, radiation. So, for example, if uh, the uh, Carimbia maculata, so spotted gum, is would be a tree that would be reasonably robust but uh, not produce uh, many embers and so on and produce good um, 
uh, wind reduction. So, but you, you'd need to choose the species. So uh, deciduous trees would be fantastic because of the, um, they're not going to produce embers and so on. So um, you, you want like a woodland environment would be the ideal, sort of 10 to 30% tree cover uh, and try to choose species that are uh, of low flammability in terms of both their bark and, and uh, also structurally sound in, in the sense of branches and so on that uh, might break off in strong winds. And in terms in terms of scale, what um, you know, trees that grow to how many meters would be preferable? Uh, so some rules of thumbs, I suppose, which is uh, that the trees will have an impact in uh, for up to about uh, ten times the tree height. So um, if you had trees that were uh, say. 30, 40, 50 metres away from the house, but sort of uh, were about 20 or 30 metres tall, they'd be having a, a significant uh, benefit in terms of um, reducing the wind. So what I'm thinking there is more of a, um, like a, a shelter belt rather than necessarily a uh, continuous area, but you could have a continuous area, but you'd want to be very careful about the species selection you, you made. Thank you. Now, here's, here's one I think for you, Kevin, that, Central Victoria has large areas of heavy gorse infestation mm. on the fringes of the grasslands and forest. How might these affect fire behaviour and spread? The area I live in, there's plenty of gorse in the in the um, landscape. So it won't affect the, the rate of spread of the fire particularly, um, but what it does do is uh, prevent access to areas and will uh, make fire suppression a lot more difficult. So... Um, if you had a, an extensive area of gorse that was burning, it would actually act as a bit of a um, uh, indraft area to, to draw in the wind. So there may be some localised reduction in, in um, the rate of spread of the grass fire, but it would be quite localised, less than 100 metres. So um, really it's just a, an impediment to access and um, suppression because they burn very hot because of the high oil content. Uh, a lot of dead material suspended in it. Uh, it's a, a, a terrible uh, fuel and we're just lucky we don't have as much as New Zealand. <laughs> and I think here's one for you, Justin. Would, would having small mounded gardens breaking up grass either slow down or accelerate a grass fire? Um, uh, any, any discontinuity um, or change in the terrain um, in terms of, of sort of breaking up will help to sort of fires will move slightly di at different speeds in the grass compared to a mulch bed or a mound. So that helps break up the intensity um, only because it has slightly different rates of spread through those different mediums. So any degree of sort of... Um, of discontinuity will help but what does it mean in the end um it really um you have to think about the house as a more more of an onion ring of consideration so if you've got um low low level dry grass right up against your house that's going to burn at some point and it might burn in a number of small erratic fronts um or it might burn as a nice big clean even line um, Kevin definitely showed how that sort of build up and continuity and consistency means more intensity because it kind of works together. Um, so in a sense, breaking it up so you're getting lots of small arrivals um, is slightly better than um, than having the broad front turn up. Um, here's, this is a very topical one. Could the urban destruction from the fires in Maui and uh, Paradise, California, occur in Australia, in particular new urban developments located in rural towns such as Romsey, Lansfield and Woodland? Perhaps um, um, just an interest in the Sure. Um, so thankfully, the way um, various US states approach their building construction and town planning it differs from Australia in a, in a few ways. They tend to build even lighter weight construction buildings than we do 
and they make a bit of an extra effort to stack them even closer together um, in a quite a uniform, consistent way, almost like a, a volume build them all the same type um, type layout. Um, the I, I, I'd say over time, I'm watching our approaches and the economics of how um, high density building estates are put together in Australia are becoming more and more like the US. I'd say our legacy building stock is um, is not as bad as these parts of the US that are that are showing um, these sort of large urban fires. Um, but I definitely are con am concerned about um, how much closer and closer we are getting to building sort of whole estates that could burn in those similar ways. Kevin? So I think just adding to that, I, I was talking to a Canadian uh, fire agency at one stage a few years ago where same thing was happening in Canada. And they were looking at the prospect of bulldozing a number of the houses to break up the the uh, the run of fire through the township, and that was going to be an incredibly difficult decision to make as to where do you start to bulldoze the houses. You'll have winners and losers in that. So uh, it's something that needs to be dealt with at the design and planning stage. It's not something that ought to be left up to uh, firefighters and and uh, left at the the time. It's it's quite predictable, and I think. Justin um, uh, has sort of pointed that out. And, and I guess um, it's not just the proximity of the houses, but it's also the building materials. And, and if you ask those firefighters um, how, they, how they can pull up such an urban, let's call it an urban conflagration fire, they would describe um, those fires as being so intense and generating such an acute amount of smoke that actually making a stand within that urban environment to pull it up, um, other than you know driving a very large dozer um, to build a fire break within it, um, is near impossible. So they're actually, for their own safety, having to actually stand back and let the fires burn out the other side of these urban environments because the they can't really make an effective stand within it. Um, that involves standing in front of the smoke and and putting up with so many coincident um, large asset fires. It's it's really important to know. Like Kevin made a a good comparison between the relative fuel load of a grassland and a forest. Or we'll put um, put an urban environment at a similar escalation again in terms of its overall representative fuel load there's much more fuel um in an urban a, a, an urban environment compared to a forest so the whole issue of intensity and process um as that unfolds is is on another level again and i'd actually i think there was a particular canadian or north american fire where while there was an urban conflagration there was so much heat going up even more so than you typically get out of a forest, that it was actually creating um, uh, or interacting with the weather and creating fire-induced winds and eddy tornadoes and stuff that that um, that looked pretty damn ominous. And that was an urban, a large yeah. urban footprint fire that it had progressed into rather than a forest fire. I'm going to try and push along. We've got quite a few questions here. If, if there's a grass fire approaching, is it better to try and stop it at the boundaries, say 400 metre away and down slope, or to stay in readiness to defend at the house? And in this case, there's only two adults present. I've got a view on this one, but I, I, who wants to have a go? Yeah. All right, I'll go first. I, I, I went to a spot fire that was 400 metres away, and while I was there, then I saw... Uh, the fire was that way. It's very sick and I was exhausted by the time I got back the 400 metres to confront the fire that was coming. I I, I, I don't think I'd ever do it again. Justin, I'd, any... I'd surmise that um, once you put it out and made that stand and run back, while you're running back, 
all the grass between you and putting that out is probably starting to go off in various spot fires. So I guess the question is to what to what outcome or effect would making a standard a border, given that you've run over a whole lot of, you know, let's say well manicured dry grass to get there, that's it that's going to burn out at some point unless you've got a very effective wetting system that's going to keep it in a non-combustible state because there'll be so many reasons and ways all of that fuel will eventually burn out. Yep, let's move on. How likely is a ground fire going to creep into the canopy of a tree? Can canopy fires start from ember attack alone? Um, yeah, yeah. No, not really. Um, you can get a uh, fire started in a canopy if a, an ember falls into some uh, dead bark in a tree, but it, that's not going to cause a canopy fire per se. So there's a difference between having a fire up in the canopy, but there wouldn't be enough continuous heat and um, ignition to set fire to the whole canopy. Or the canopy would be too, uh, eucalypt canopy would be too dispersed. So um what would be required would be a considerable more uh, fuel as elevated fuel shrubs and, and um, bark on the trees to basically get in the the um, the heat at, in the canopy or a very steep slope to to get that continuity. So embers alone won't uh, start a canopy fire. Is a longer, well watered lawn better for stopping grass fires due to preserving soil moisture? <laughs> the soil moisture is not the critical thing here. It's a fuel moisture. So um, if if there's no dead material in your, your lawn, which is a little bit unlikely, um, then uh, the, the, the soil moisture will keep the, the grass moist for longer. But if it dries out in a drought or whatever, it, or on a really hot day, it will still burn. So the soil moisture on its own is not going to do it. It's, it's the condition of the grass that's important. And... As I say, on top of that is this thatch idea that if there's dead material in amongst it, that the soil moisture is not going to have that much influence on the um, uh, the thatch layer. So I've, I've seen kakuyu grass uh, that looks totally lush and green burn quite well, smolder quite happily. It's, it's not a, a fl big flaming front, but it continues to burn and provides um, a source of ignition for, uh, could be for hours. If you have limited ability to reduce all possible hazards, is it more valuable to prioritise preventing ember ingress into the building than reducing the fuel sources? Start from, say, the house and move outwards in terms of your consideration. So eliminating or creating an ember-resistant house, if I was to list the hierarchy of things, would be step one and then very soon after that would be eliminating um, vegetative fuel sources immediately around the structure um, as a very close second but you almost have to do those two things as a box set because the embers are going to attack your house directly or they're going to attack the the fine fuel debris around your house which are then is going to attack your house so really they're both all into the and ember attack consideration camp. We are having some trees removed next week in our driveway and they want to mulch them and spread mulch up our driveway. Don't spray it anywhere near. The further away from your house, the better. And um, definitely go back to that, um, making sure your house is ember proof for a whole range of reasons, um, that being an additional source. And and consider the um, use of your driveway as a a possible path that you may need to navigate in an extreme event. Um, so think about separation from the physical driveway itself and the fuel loads along it. The problem of burning mulch is how long it burns for. It will smolder for a long period of time, so it makes the duration of your um, your fight much longer. So that's what uh, is a major hazard in itself. And considering sort of your composting window between getting it down and how well it'll compost in before things get too dry, that it'll just remain as consistent mulch on the surface in a dry state. On bushfire days, 
as the temperature climbs, most of us are looking to the north or the northwest for a for a fire threat. Um, is it is it most likely that um, property is only going to be impacted by bushfire when the wind is coming from the north or the northwest? Are those the most likely directions? Uh, on a big fire day, uh, that's true, but um, fires can come from any direction. But if you haven't got a fire already existing in the landscape, then um, looking to the north or northwest would be, um, or fires in that direction are likely, in, in, if we're looking in southeastern Australia, they're likely to be that cause the biggest problems. But when it gets within, say, uh, 10 or 20 kilometres of you, then the potential of the fire to come at you from any direction is a, a real possibility. So, um, yeah, bad, hot, northerly uh, wind days are, are already a, a bad sign. But, uh, yeah, the, in terms of the attack on your, your property, it could come from any direction once it's within about 20K of your property. Justin, do we know from your research how many houses were destroyed from the north or northwest compared to on the, the southwest wind change? Yeah, actually, the vast majority of houses were lost, um, what you'd say, on the wind change. So as it folded from a, a northerly driven system to a south southwest, the dynamics of, of how all the winds were rolling and folding meant that there was significant additional wind and that erratic nature and severity of the wind played a significant role in and i guess you're also sort of turning the fire from a fairly small impact footprint to a very large front which is the other reason you've just got a lot of assets in the way on the change but it was surprising how many houses burnt actually on the change rather than um in the hours once the change had kicked in and created a much larger landscape um, fire. So, yeah, um, yeah I, I would, it's certainly after the, after the change rather than after and during the change rather than prior. Thank you to everyone who's joined us. Following tonight's webinar, you'll receive a short and confidential feedback survey. Please take a few minutes to um, respond. Um, I'd like to, we acknowledge Max Gatter and Mark Gravel, John Huff, Lisa O'Brien, Alan Bloom, Peter Mildenhall, Max Coleman, Jason McFadden, Rob Reed Smith, Tammy Garrett, and Rowan Thornton for their commitment to conducting this uh, webinar series and for maintaining our uh, our website. Special thanks um, to Michael Vermeulen, who's made a very successful debut as our Zoom host tonight. Um, and uh, thanks to Rowan Thornton for his technical assistance and advice. Thanks also to Arthur Coates and Cathy Overton for their help. Our, our next webinar, our final webinar for 2023, is on Wednesday the 4th of October at 7.30, um, um, Eastern Australian time, and it'll be titled Safety Actions for the Fire Season. Um, with uh, Craig Lapsley, Jamie McKenzie, and Steve Pascoe. And for interstate viewers, please note it's daylight saving time in several of the eastern states. So you'll need to check up your times. We look forward to seeing you then. Thank you and good night. <laughs>